Afternoon guys, Dr. Ken Norberg here again with another fireside hunting seminar for you. It's been an interesting series. I'm not quite sure how many different uh, uh, presentations are going to make on the, the current subject, uh, but it could be as many as seven. <laughs> it's that important. We've done some of this before. But during the past oh, four years, at least, maybe a little longer, whitetails have been changing quite a bit, a lot. One reason being a uh, changing climate. It's getting warmer in, in fall and in November when we hunt whitetails. Warmer temperatures can have a dramatic effect, particularly on northern whitetails which uh, grow fur beginning around the 1st of September that will keep them comfortable throughout winter when temperatures are down to 40, even 45 degrees below zero. And because they grow fur like that, when it's unusually warm in, uh, oh, let's say, uh, October and November, their habits and behavior can become quite different than they used to be. And that's what's been happening with climate change. Well, up to this point, we've pretty well covered what's been happening to our whitetails and why, and how their habits have been changing and why that's been happening, and the problems that's created for us hunters. Now. You might hunt in an area where there's no wolves. <laughs> but the way things are going, you know, wolves are being introduced all over the country. And uh, nowadays there are a lot of people who are against hunting or trapping of wolves, reducing their numbers where needed. And because of that, if that sort of thing continues, uh, if wolves are ever introduced in your area, Eventually, it's likely you're going to end up with the same problems us Nordbergs have been having now for the last three years, or four years. And uh, so, these are good things to know. But another thing that's happening at the same time is climate change. And it doesn't matter where you hunt whitetails. Climate change is changing their habits. So you have that problem. And we'll be covering that more now in future uh, seminars. But anyway, we're going to be talking about hunting methods uh, to hunt deer in these situations. Now keep this in mind. It doesn't matter if you have wolves or <laughs> where you hunt or if climate change has made a really big difference in habits of whitetails. What you're going to learn now is how to hunt whitetails under adverse conditions no matter what. I mean, let's say you have a week of really hot weather where you're hunting. You, these are the things you're going to want to do when hunting uh, in that kind of weather. So, you know, it's not something for the future for everybody. What, what I'm trying to teach you now is for now. And so, uh, it's kind of, I'm kind of anxious to get started on this. Uh, one of the things that is always in the back of my mind in thinking about these things is the 15 years I spent with uh, neighbors and family uh, making drives. Uh, I was part of a gang of hunters, usually there were 11 of us, and that's all we did all day long is make drives. And we took a lot of deer. We really did, uh, but at, sometimes we'd fill out, we'd have our 11 deer in two days. I remember one year by noon on the second day, we were all done hunting. <laughs> and there was a big tree in my Uncle Jack's yard, farmyard, where we hung our deer uh, to, you know, to cool after a day of hunting. And it'd be all full of deer. And we were kind of famous for that. Uh, people from all around the countryside would drive over to Jack's house, his farm, to see how the Nordbergs have been doing deer hunting. But 
what is, the thing that bugged me most about it is that in all those 15 years, we hardly ever got a buck that was older than a yearling. Only one was taken that ended up being mounted, put on the wall. And that always bugged me. I wanted to hunt bucks. <laughs> I was a kid with goofy ideas. I, you know, I started out with that bunch at age 10, so I thought, oh, I wanted to get those big bucks out there. And a couple times I saw them in the woods, but didn't get them. So I wanted to hunt differently, and so I changed from that. So, but one of the things that guys in the gang, and especially my uncle would say, you know, we'd be saying, oh man, it's drizzling out there today, or there's snowing, or it's winds blowing really loud, hard, or it's warm. You know, we didn't have warm Novembers back in those days. But you could have, it didn't matter what the weather was, how weather was affecting white tails. He'd say, it doesn't matter what's going on out there, we get deer anyway. Because when we make a drive, whatever those deer are doing, if they're bedded somewhere and, and, and don't want to move because it's too warm or stormy or whatever, we make them move anyway. And for that reason, we took a lot of deer. And uh, <laughs> we stay, opening morning was always our best drive, it was a mile long drive, but we'd, we'd always get deer anyway. So I keep thinking about that. Now, during the last 30 years, my sons and I have developed several new hunting methods that are especially good for hunting older bucks. And they're all listed, I use them, in my latest edition of Wentz Hunter's Almanac. And I keep thinking, you know, if we use the, the drive technique as a basis for those hunting methods, there's five of them that, are, that I'm thinking about, uh, like progressive whitetail hunting and mile a day deer hunting and a gentle nudge, uh, uh, opportunistic stand hunting, cover all bases, they're all covered in that book. If we turn those into group, larger group hunting methods, you know, like if we have 11 people in our camp every year now, we take 11 people and put them together hunting in specific areas during the day together. We're going to be creating drives. But I figure if we do it ultra slow drives, that's like mile a day, that's a pretty slow drive. They only travel, uh, move to an area a mile long in a day. When, when you apply group hunting to, to hunting that slowly, making drives that slowly, it has several advantages. One of them is, the biggest one is, you aren't going to chase all the deer out of the area. You could go back the next day and make a drive there again, and the same deer will be there because they won't leave the area. It, the way people make drives nowadays, you go through their day one, there isn't going to be any deer there for at least a week and probably not for the, near as many for uh, the entire hunting season. The way aggressive drives, the way they're done nowadays, that can really an empty an area of whitetails quickly, in a matter of hours. No more deer there. You're all done hunting this area. Okay, we gotta go somewhere else, make another drive. So, you know, if if you do this slowly enough, and boy, you know, a mile a day still hunting, was, but that's pretty slow. But let's say you put six guys together doing this, or six guys uh, or more uh, doing a gentle nudge together. Uh, we already know that you know, what this method I call cover all bases works good. We've taken several really nice bucks using that that were proving to be really difficult to hunt. We got them anyway using that method. But I'm thinking now, large group uh, uh, stand hunting, uh, cooperative stand hunting, and that's an exciting thing. And you know, I, we've had three years now to try to figure out how to improve our hunting with what's been going on in our hunting area up in northern Minnesota. Last year, um, we tried plan A, <laughs> finding more deer and opening up trails in the distant areas we've never hunted or hardly ever hunted in, in 30 years. And we found some deer there early, uh, last year, the year before, in the fall, and then in the following spring, 
But by the time the season opened in November, they weren't there anymore. They were gone. Those extra bucks that we planned to hunt weren't there. And, and I, I can't believe it was simply a matter of them hiding somewhere because when I spent two days during the previous year looking for these extra deer that might be hiding while breeding is in progress, these bucks that hide because uh, big dominant breeding bucks are so dangerous while breeding is going on, I, I found some, but then I put trail cams in those areas and you know, there was no, this year, or last spring, I put trail cams in those areas and there was nothing, no bucks there. All year, all the way, I picked them up in November, checked them out, no bucks in those areas. They were gone. Nothing, no deer hiding in that area. Our deer numbers have been reduced so much. Uh, the wolves either, the wolves probably got those deer that were there. So anyway, uh, plan A didn't work. So now we're down to plan B. So now what we're going to be doing is adapting really, really good hunting methods for taking whitetails anywhere. It doesn't matter where you hunt. Alabama, Maine, Texas, uh, Wisconsin, wherever you hunt. These are really good hunting methods designed for hunting older bucks. But we're going to make them into like hunters making a drive. We're going to move deer Anyway, no matter what the condition, I don't care how hot it is, those deer are going to be moved during the day using this kind of a, uh, an adaptation of our really good hunting methods. So you're going to want to know how to use those methods to make this work out really well. But it's kind of fun. I'm going to have a lot of fun talking about this. This is kind of interesting and there's a lot to know. Uh, you know, most of you, I know, have been really scratching your heads about what to do, how to hunt during these periods. And a lot of you guys, you know, you bought my books, and my books, I've all, most of all the material that was written in there was written before these changes became more pronounced three years ago. Now we've had three years of it, so now we know these changes are, are, are happening. And we've been working at trying to figure out how in the world are we going to continue to be as successful at taking mature bucks as we used to be in the past. Uh, between 1990 and 2018, my boys took about four big mature bucks per year. and at least one or two of them were dominant breeding bucks. You know, you can have lesser bucks that are, yeah, you know, most, where uh, deer numbers are normal. Let's say, like in our era, when we started out, well, they were still subnormal there because of all the wolves. But in most areas, maybe you'll have Oh, anywhere from 15 to 23 deer per square mile in there. That's a lot of deer. It's hard to believe, well, except in some states like in, uh, in Michigan where they commonly have 30 deer per square mile in lots of areas. There's this area in central Wisconsin like that. There's areas on the east coast like that uh, where there's that many deer. And, um, but most areas uh, have at least Ideally, you know, as far as whitetails are concerned, they kind of wish, I'm sure they'd think this way, if they could, that I wish there was only 15 of us per square mile, because that would be just right for a deer population from year to year. But because double, whitetails can double a number every year, uh, one of our jobs as hunters, we're volunteer hunters, we volunteer to keep whitetail numbers within the carrying capacities of their ranges. Another way of saying is, we reduce deer numbers every fall, so the remaining deer will have enough to eat in the winter time. And there's a lot of places in a lot of states now where we're failing miserably. Even though we're the best equipped hunters in the world for hunting deer, we're failing. And when you got 30 deer per square mile, you're really failing there. And there's reasons for that. Like, Maybe a lot of posted land, you know, people don't want you to shoot the deer, kill the deer in that area. They, those are their pets. They hate to see them hurt, but 
you're going to learn later what a, what a mistake that is. <laughs> Same way with, with making pets out of wolves and not wanting anything to, anybody to harm a wolf. Boy, can that cause a big problem like we have here in Minnesota right now. Well, so far everything I've been saying is to point out the fact that things have been changing rapidly in our deer woods. And what was good or true 10 years ago, in some cases, isn't good or true today. Those darn whitetails, they're, they're smart animals. And they're capable of adapting in ways that can be really frustrating. And some of the adaptations, my sons and I and my other and daughters and, and in-laws and friends have been seeing in the woods during the last three years are really frustrating, making it difficult to hunt older bucks. We're, we're kind of used to getting four a year, and now the last two years all we've been able to manage is one buck per season for the bunch of us. That's really unusual. You know, we've been being careful about not over hunting our bucks, but the wolves haven't been careful about that, and that's not their fault. They just got to be so numerous uh, that there's Finally, they finally eliminated about 97% of all the deer that once lived in the area where we hunt. It used to be 22 per square mile there way back in the early 1960s. And uh, then we had a series of severe winters that really dropped the number of whitetails in northern Minnesota, almost completely eliminating them in two counties in the northeastern. We call that the Arrowhead region of Minnesota, between Lake Superior and Canada. That's the size of Massachusetts. And uh, so the deer numbers really dropped then and it really affected wolves. And then in 1974, the wolves were selected for protection by the Endangered Species Act. That was 47 years ago. Now, this last January, they were finally delisted. There's finally enough wolves there to satisfy anybody who thought there should be more wolves up there. But it was much too late. All kinds of things have been happening. I've talked about that in the past, but our wolves now are starving. There's not enough deer for them anymore, and, they're, and they be almost completely wiped out the beavers. And right now, if we have any amount of snow this winter, they won't even be able to catch mice. It's going to be tough on wolves this winter. A lot of lower wolves are going to perish this winter because of starvation, because there just aren't enough deer or anything else to feed them there anymore. So anyway, uh, but these changes have been going on. That's what we're dealing with today. And if you haven't seen it yet, it's probably in your future because there's been a big move to, uh, to reestablish wolves, gray wolves, Anywhere, everywhere possible. Uh, there are some who say we should not reduce wolf numbers in any area until wolves have been reestablished in all areas where they were previously common. And that's, you know, that's kind of a good idea, I suppose, but it's sure not a good idea in Minnesota where they've been protected now for 47 years and some awful things have happened because of that. Well, anyway, because of all these changes, things are happening in Minnesota like this right now, and it sounds like they're happening in Upper Michigan and Wisconsin and other states around the United States as well. And this kind of change might be in your future, something to think about. If you have anything to say about deer and wolf management in your state, remember what you're learning here in the next few seminars, because this could be important to the future of your deer hunting. Okay, let's go over what we did last year uh, with our plan A. So let's let's take a look at a map. I got a new map for you to look at here. And because our deer numbers have become so low in in our area, down to about three per square mile, maybe a fraction above that per square mile, and it took a lot of work to determine that, but. Because we've gotten down to that point and have so few mature bucks anymore to hunt, I decided last year I, we need to find more bucks to hunt. And there were some areas that I thought, well, maybe 
we might find more in areas that we haven't hunted much, if at all, during the last 30 years. Uh, further away from our camp, further away in this 10 square miles. Some of that 10 square miles we hardly ever got to during the last 30 years. And I thought, might be interesting to go in and, and scout through those areas. And I did a lot of that last year during the last two days of the hunting season. And I found some extra bucks out there that were mature. Well, anyway, as, as I was starting to say, I decided to scout this section here real extensively last year. Scout it well beyond well beyond it in both directions, but this particular area because we there's portions of this we've never seen before. I've never seen before, never hunted before, and I thought, well, maybe there's some buck hiding places, some of these lesser bucks that hide while those are in heat and the big buck is really dangerous, that they'll hide in little places around in this area perhaps. And I found some spots like that, small areas, maybe a half acre in size only, next to water and good food, browse or grass, uh, and a lot of timber to hide them. I found some places, three of them, three bucks that uh, according to their track and dropping size were probably two and a half, three and a half years of age. I said, well, next year those would be decent bucks to hunt. And so I went and checked it. I put trail cams on those little hideaways so I could make sure that they were being used this coming hunting season. And then meanwhile, John and I did all kinds of scouting and, and uh, uh, our, our new hunting partner, Rick Beeson, and we scouted this whole central area really well. And uh, this is an older trail here, we call that Slippery Rock Trail. And this is an old trail coming around here, and that's the Moose Mountain Trail. <laughs> but we, were, we went all through this area and figured out how to connect these others so we could make use of them. And that's kind of important sometimes because if, if you're going to hunt stand sites along the Moose Mountain Trail and the wind is wrong, maybe then you could come in from another direction and, and the wind wouldn't be a problem. So we, we wanted to connect those up so they were kind of circular in nature. And we did the same thing with the Slippery Rock Trail, connected that, that up. And uh, so that's what we did. And we had all these red lines, and this should have been red here too, this here. And, uh, all those red lines were new trails we established, and they were actually, they were deer trails to begin with, connecting deer trails, this main line here. And uh, which we do, which we use because for one reason it's illegal for us to be making new trails for ourselves on public land. We can't do that. And illegal in Minnesota to do that. So, okay, we'll use deer trails and where they're covered with brush and fallen trees, well, I'll either go around the fallen trees and pick up the brush and throw them aside and kind of get them cleaned up so we can walk on them fairly silently come the hunting season. That's a lot of work. And mark them with fluorescent tacks so we can go to these spots really early in the morning. Well, so we did that. And then we connect that up with some of these other trails. This one here is the, the Oak Ridge Trail. <laughs> And we connected that up to here, but all these uh, dotted lines coming off of that main trail are stand site approach trails, new stand sites that where we found evidence a big buck has been spending time here. You know, lots of big tracks, tracks that are three and uh, three eighths inch or longer, three and three eighths be like a two and a half year old buck, and then we get up to three and a three quarter, and we're looking at bigger bucks like. Uh, three and a half to four and a half year old bucks. But when you get into the bigger bucks, the big dominant breeding bucks, we're looking at four inch tracks. Well, we didn't find any four inch tracks in this. Turns out there was one. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But anyway, that was, a, that was our work. We made four trips up north this last year between uh, late April and mid-October getting this area ready to hunt, because we had three extra mature bucks to hunt in this area. So giving us a much better chance to get more than one buck this year. Now my son Dave and, and my son Ken hunt areas way over here somewhere. 
and so it was just John and I and then Rick Beeson with us and then a new hunter, my grandson Jacob, 13 years old, his first year of deer hunting. So we were going to be hunting this area, but we, we had a dozen new stand sites and every day you could pick out more because we, a lot of our stand sites are just good cover, a good concealment provided by a natural cover. You don't have to do anything to get them ready when you sit on a stool at ground level. And so we, bills are all over the place throughout this area, so we weren't worried about, you know, not finding 30 stand sites. But we had enough for a good start all over this place. All these red X's are new ones. And uh, that we connected up with previous trails and made nice, what we call cruise trails. These cruise trails are our main trails. They're our trunk lines to where we hunt. And our stand sites trails branch off of that. And sometimes our stand sites end up right next to it because this trail is Favored is used a lot by a big buck. You know, there's his tracks and droppings in the trail. They go, oh man, we gotta hunt this trail. So we'll get off of it. <laughs> but anyway, and let's say we want to hunt this one and the wind is blowing from this direction. Well, we come in this way and go over to this stand site and sit there. And this, there's no human trail scent over here when we do that. So we've got to set up so we could get to all kinds of stand sites from downwind. Now, when we're on the cruise trail, we don't worry about wind direction. And you know what? It doesn't take long. Well, it takes more on one deer season, but it doesn't take long for deer to decide you're nothing to worry about when you're walking on these trails. Because when we walk on those trails during hunting seasons, we never stop. We're never looking from side to side and stopping and looking around. You just walk straight through to wherever you're going to go, and there, sit down at your stand site. And when you walk that way, you can have deer all along these trails. They'll just watch you go by and not be concerned about you because that's harmless behavior. But when you start stopping and looking around, you're dangerous. And they're going to abandon that area, and they won't be there all day. They might not come back to that area for five days or longer. If they... If they get frightened enough to raise his tails and bound away, and if it's a big buck, he's gone for the season. You won't see him during the next two weeks or whatever, how long your hunting season is. So, the way you walk on those trails makes a lot of difference. But these little short trails coming off here are stand site trails. And we only use a stand site once, sometimes twice per hunting season. And we change stand sites every half day. So, after, you know, your trail scent lasts four days. Can, white tails can identify you by your trail scent on these trails for four days. Oh, we might go over here on Monday morning and come on and gee, we didn't see a deer there, but we think, boy, we should have. That's such a good spot there. There's this clear cut over here is growing up, but it's just such a good spot. And if nothing happened there, I'm going to go back five days later. And then sometimes that works. That works every now and then to go back. But you won't see anything there for four or five days after you've been there because of your trail scent. So each one of those is only used once. And after, after four or five days, it's like opening day all over again at that stand site. So we got all these stand sites we can use along the way. And they're positioned so that... No matter what direction the wind is blowing, we can always approach that stand site from downwind or crosswind, every time. So we spent a lot of time getting this central area here set up for deer hunting this last year. And you know what happened? In all those places, I didn't record one buck long periods with the trail camps set there in these hideaways. No buck. Meaning, the darn wolves had gotten those, had found those bucks before we did. They either killed them or chased them out of the country, you know. And they, these wolves up here, there's only three in our pack now. We've talked about that before, but they're pretty desperate for food. And these deer that are left here, these three per square mile, they're being bothered by these wolves all the time. And they've had to learn to do new things to avoid them regularly. 
and we'll get to that later. But and we've talked about it a little bit before. But those darn highways were empty. The trail sounds didn't get any pictures of deer in them, of buck sound. They were gone. What we learned is there was one big dominant buck who owned this whole area. And not only here, but across the road, and he was covering an area I, getting close to two square miles in size. And that was typical because we learned during the last hunting season there were only three big dominant bucks in that four and a half to six and a half year old class of deer, of bucks, in our in town area, ten square miles. And they were doing their best to breed all those in heat during that two weeks that we were there. Anyway, th there was, in this area, one buck was trying to take care of all the does in an area about almost two square miles in size. And he was on the move day and night. The other bucks were missing because the wolves either got them or chased them out of the country during that period. Anyway, here we are. We have one big dominant buck here. The only buck in the whole, well, there was a smaller one that hanged around our camp. It was a yearling last year, two and a half year old this year, but he was he was the breeding buck for a huge, much bigger area than those bucks of ours are used to, and so he was on the go constantly. And I'll tell you, there was no way to determine where he would be next for another reason. These does that were still here, that lived in this region, including up here got together. They herded early. They've been doing that for four years now, actually. And they they herd in early November or earlier, because this is usually when when uh, wolves form packs. They don't live in packs year-round. They break up into breeding pairs in the spring and then come together again and by the end of the first week in November every year. Well, so they, they would form a herd. And the herd it gives these deer, remaining deer a better chance of survival because if they are found, chances are only one deer would be taken and be one fawn. But if they were living apart every time they found one doe with a fawn, they are almost certain to kill that fawn. So the odds that their fawn, remaining fawns would, li would live to grow bigger would be better if they lived in herds during this time. And the herds were generally dominated by one big older doe who had probably lived five, six, seven, eight years already, had already survived that many, eight maybe, hunting seasons and wolves hunting them all the time. She survived it. She was smart about how to avoid wolves and hunting humans. And those does were bunching up and all the does in this whole area and there weren't that many. And all their young, their yearlings and fawns, were together. And what they were doing is feeding at night only. They became nocturnal. And what was really crazy is, as trail cams were telling us, they were primarily active between 11.30 at night and 3.30 in the morning. Well, they were a little later and earlier than that during the night and sometimes, but they would be together right in the middle of the night. And that's really unusual. It wasn't that way in the past. And how do you hunt deer that only move at night? And what made it even worse, you know, those bunches of does would feed together and bed together. And wherever they fed together, you come there in the morning and say, holy cow, look at all the fresh deer tracks here. We all were saying that every once in a while. It was happening here, it was happening over there, and it was happening over there, where, where my other sons were hunting. There would be all kinds of deer trucks. It seemed like it must be a hundred deer hunting there. Well, there weren't any hundred deer, but there were a lot of them. And in the old days, boy, that was a dynamite place to hunt because a lot of those deer weren't alarmed by you. During the next very next period, they're going to feed, which might be later today or tomorrow morning. They're going to come back to that area to feed again. And if any of those does are in heat. And a lot of times we know it, especially if there's snow on the ground, because the, the buck with them would be dragging his hoofs.
or a doe would have red, uh, blood spots in the urine. But if, if it was a doe and estrogen estrogen, that big down the bucket area would be certainly with them. And we'd get them. <laughs> we knew that. Those would be for, bucks for the wall almost always. Well, at any rate, so that was how, one of the secrets of oh, our success as hunters. But you see what was happening now, those does were only, they were bunched together, having the advantage of an older doe to keep them safe, those antlerless deer. Anyway, yeah, and the does would never feed in the same place the whole time we hunted. We were up there for two years. They did not move. If you fall in a place like that, you'd be all excited. Oh boy, have I got a spot to hunt now later today or in the morning. Never come back. And, and we know we didn't alarm them. They did this on their own volition. A smart doe who said, if we, we can't keep going back or the wolves and humans will get us, so we're going to move every time we want to eat. And then never come back. And same with our, where we bed. We're not going to go back to the old bedding spots like we do all summer long in early fall. We're going to move. This bed in different spots as well. And we'll move two miles if we have to. And they did that. And those big bucks were traveling huge areas all day long, every day, day and night, during that period. How in the world do you hunt those deer? You know, it's really hard. And so that's what we're working on today. And so, and this big down the book was trying to keep track of where they are and breed them when they're in heat in this time. And what a mess this was for deer hunting this past year. And it's been that way for two years now. Actually four, because I remember the year that we had all that snow like on the cover of my 10th edition of Wednesday Arms Almanac, deep snow. They were already doing it then, but I thought it was because of the snow. But they've been doing the same darn thing with no snow. And you get a little bit of snow and then you find these tracks swollen in place and you just couldn't help but think, oh, we got to hunt those spots. And they would not, there would be no deer there tomorrow or later today or the whole rest of the hunting season. You couldn't predict where the heck they'd be because they could move so far. They were moving so far. They had a, these, there could be does from, three, four different home ranges. Usually they have their own home ranges that those with young. And so that would be a, a mile all by itself and they, that they could move that far, but they were moving even further than that. And man, they, they could go, you could go to that spot and, and that day you'd fought, learn later and the next day, geez, the next spot was a mile and a half away. And that's what they were doing. And how smart can you be? And how do you hunt them? Well, sir, that's what you're going to learn. How do you hunt deer doing this? And I'll tell you something. You know, they're trying to introduce wolves all over America. They'll get a wolves everywhere. And unless those wolves are well managed so that there's a good ratio of wolves to prey in that area, so deer numbers can remain stable. If they start going to hound downhill, there's too many wolves. So deer numbers could remain stable. And then wolves are healthy and happy and the deer are normal and healthy as well. You don't get into this kind of a mess. But once you're in this, how are you going to hunt there? You're going to go somewhere else? Maybe. We've thought about that. But you know, we've had 30 years of really great hunting here and we just hate to leave it. And we've seen signs that maybe things are going to get better. For one thing, our wolves are taking off uh, were delisted from the, the Endangered Species Act on January 4th of this year. Meaning, we can, now our state managers can, can create wolf hunting seasons to get those numbers down to the point where those deer can finally start increasing in number again. And beavers as well, because these wolves have just about cleaned all the beavers out of this country as well. But, we need to, once you get those deer numbers, those wolf numbers down, things are going to start to improve. And now, these older does that have started this early herding are smart. 
and they've been successful at avoiding wolves because there are more fawns. There were more fawns in our hunting area, study area, this year than we've seen in three, four years, and that's an improvement. So, if given those deer a chance, getting those deer wolf numbers down, so more of those fawns can survive a year and become yearlings and then older. We're going to, before long, what, two, three years, we're going to be starting to see some pretty decent hunting in there again. So, seeing these signs and knowing we're going to have a wolf reduction program of some kind this coming year, we think that we're going to stick it out. You know, and if we only get one buck a year for the next couple of years, we're going to be satisfied with that. Because we just hate to leave this country and know it so well, and we love this area for hunting and what we do, and and living in tents up there the whole time, real comfortably, and all the things we do. We hate to disrupt it, so we're willing to wait. It might not happen in my lifetime, <laughs> but we're willing to wait. Now, another thing is encouraging is that these wolves are now having a really hard time finding enough food. And well, there's all kinds of evidence of it, about six different things that point to the fact that they're not finding enough food. And not having pups is one of them. Now they did have some pups this last year, for the first time in 11 years. But there's only three in our pack, three wolves, they're, and they're having a hard time. And what's happening now is that, you know, years ago when you had big packs, you'd have, let's say you had 12 wolves in the pack. And they had a hunting area, 100 square miles in size, they did. Most of these big packs had these big, huge hunting areas. And if any other wolf snuck in there, they'd be in big trouble. They could get killed by the pack. So they own that. Now that the packs are little, what we've ended up with is a lot of small packs in smaller areas. So the wolf number, total wolf numbers, uh, the counts that have been made show that their, their numbers are stable, but it's because there's more small packs in smaller areas. So, and they're all having trouble finding enough to eat. Uh, primarily in the middle third of the uh, Arrowhead region in Minnesota, between Lake Superior and Canada. An area the size of Massachusetts. <laughs> big area, big wilderness area. Well, anyway, what's, the way things are now, for the wolves living, the three wolves and their pups now, and they don't have much of a chance of surviving this winter because they're going to be starving. But those wolves that live in that area now have not been able to reduce the deer population any further because those 3%, a little over, that remain are too doggone smart for them. They know how to stay away from those wolves. So these wolves aren't getting venison like that. They, they get venison from fawns in the summer, but not not in the winter, and because and so these wolves are stuck. They can't get much venison, if any, this winter. Beavers are gone. They've eaten almost all of those up. They get any amount of snow in the ground, they can't even find mice to eat. They're going to have a hard time surviving this winter. This winter, we can see an awful lot of our wolves starving to death because of the situation up there. And uh, so whether Mother Nature does that, you know, whether it's this year or next year, if you have a severe winter, we already know a severe winter can kill wolves. And the winter of 1992 uh, to 93, we had snow hip deep deep up there on Halloween day. And the wolf pack we had at that time, all of them died. There were no wolves in that area during the following year. And finally the year after that, we had a new bunch of wolves in there again. But, so they can, you know, deep snow can be hard on wolves, if, if especially the soft snow and they sink in it, you know, like the deer will. And uh, so, we know that can happen. If we have a severe winter this way, you know, you couple deep snow with deer they can't catch, and hardly anything else there for them to catch, except maybe an occasional grouse. So, a lot of wolves are going to die this year. I hate to see that happen. You know, I like wolves. I like to hear them howling. Uh, they're exciting. They're fun to see. They're they're really beautiful animals. And uh, 
they add so much to our time that we spend in our wilderness area hunting deer. And I hope there's always wolves there. But I don't like to see the way they've been treated in the last 47 years. So, well, I get back to you in the next seminar. We're going to continue on this vein on what to do where you have a big problem with large predators. Besides reducing numbers of predators, that can be kind of hard. Politicians, governors, whatnot, uh, judges, all kinds of people, pro-wolf groups, don't want you to, they don't want you to reduce wolf numbers. Another, uh, maybe you could call it even Plan C, <laughs> is improving your odds by keying on only the very best oh, circumstances or weather conditions or periods, things that whitetails do during the rut, things like that, the very best of those things. Just key on those and don't mess around with iffy stand sites anymore when you have these problems. Only go to the very best that are, uh, spots to hunt where your odds are the very best for taking uh, whitetails, especially an older buck. So I've got some, uh, I, we've got some ways that you can improve your odds one-on-one. -on -one. Let's say you don't belong to a gang of 12 guys, you know. It's just you and your son or you and your brother or you and your wife or whatever. Just a couple of you. What do you do? Well, this next seminar is going to be all about that. <laughs> and so we'll start with that one, and then we're going to go to each of those hunting methods that I mentioned, and we're going to make, we're going to adapt them to hunting uh, during adverse conditions, like making a drive, but ultra slow, so you aren't chasing deer out of the air, so you, you don't ruin your hunting area in a matter of hours. You can hunt there day after day using these methods. So, kind of an exciting uh, bunch of subjects to talk about here in future seminars, so looking forward to that. Okay, with that, <coughs> I'll quit now. <laughs> and uh, thanks for watching, and remember now, Christmas is coming, there's still time to order books, and uh, they can usually be there within four days. And uh, remember too that when you order them from my website, you can get a free previously published book. And they're smaller books, but you get a free one. That's $10 value, so that's kind of nice to get. So keep that in mind. And when, if you're ordering for a husband or a son or a daughter or an uncle or a dad or whatever, uh, be sure to mention on the forum who it's for. So when I autograph it, I can put to whoever it's for. You know, personally autograph it for that person. So do that. Well, okay, well, thanks again for watching, guys, and uh, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the thumbs up if you enjoyed what you learned today, and uh, as a favor to me, because that's important to my future as a YouTube seminar speaker. Okay, see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries, my website bookstore, and much more.